So now let me introduce uh, David Laney. David is our presenter today. And what uh, David and I go uh, way back, uh, we've been friends for 25 years plus back in the uh, days when Dr. Deming was still uh, roaming the earth and uh, helping us all understand continuous improvement. And uh, David is a former uh, statistician with Bell South Corporation for 33 years, and um, he uh, invented a new way of analyzing attribute data, which is now known as the Laney control chart. And at this point, I'm going to turn over the presentation to David and let him tell you all about his new control chart. OK, thanks, Tom. Can you hear me? Sure can. OK. Um, First, thank you for the opportunity to participate in this. I'm real excited about this still. Um, I, it was the last thing I did before retiring. In fact, the month I retired from Bell South, the paper came out in quality engineering. So <laughs> uh, kind of a parting shot. Uh, before getting into the presentation of what this is and how it works, I thought I'd just give a quick um, by the way, what you're seeing on the screen is my previous mode of transportation um, and, and uh, also how I paid for it. Uh, in the last few years of my working career, I, I never took any real vacations. I would uh, go out and take assignments teaching to other companies how to do this. What, what else would a statistician do on vacation but teach statistics, right? There you go. Anyway. Um, in about 1990, I guess, we, we started to get Bell South into PQM in a big way. And I was trying to teach everybody how to do control charts. And here's what you do if you have, if you're looking at uh, percentage errors. And here's what you do if you're looking at uh, um, time to repair, or whatever. And an application came in that sort of baffled us. It was uh, looking at monthly data of emergency 911 calls in the state of Florida. Now, the state of Florida, as you might guess, has probably a disproportionate number of calls to, to 911. Um, there's a, a, quite a few folks there who all used to live in Manhattan um, who are somewhat elderly now and tend to need 911 more than most. Anyway, we were looking at the percentage of such calls that did not go through, a rather concerning statistic, need, needless to say, trying to make the system work better. Everything was fine. We put, it, put the data on the P-chart, of course, and there was one problem. The control limits were seemed to be rather narrow. That's a matter of the perspective of the graph, I guess. But the data were all over the place. Every point was out of control. And that didn't make a lot of sense. How can everything be out of control? And we realized rather quickly that the denominators in these cases were in the tens or hundreds of thousands. Naturally, any p times 1 minus p over n, that with an n that big, is going to be microscopic. So that the sigma times 3, added and subtracted to the center line, is going to be like plus or minus nothing. The data couldn't possibly fit inside that. Well, I was still kind of new to control charts at that point. One looked it up in the Western Electric or AT&T handbook. Um, and it said, oh, this is nothing. We've seen this before. Just put the data in an individual's chart, an X chart, or IMR chart if you're a Minitab user. And we did, and everything worked out fine. Except then we realized that the sample sizes, month by month by month, were very different. In summer months, when it's real hot in Florida, there were way more calls to 911 than during the winter months. And in a P-chart, we've gotten, gotten used to seeing the control limits, in such a case, wiggle. With large subgroup sizes, you expect the limits to be narrow. With small subgroup sizes, you expect them to be wide can't do that in an individual's chart. It is what it is. 
So we puzzled over that, and that was what led to the, the initially worrying about this. Shortly thereafter, I happened to be sitting in Knoxville, Tennessee, in a uh, conference room with Don Wheeler, taking his, uh, I forget, I've taken so many courses under him, I forget which one it was, but he was talking about analysis of variance uh, at the moment of my great awakening. And he was um, reiterating the bit about between so, so between group variation and within group variation and how you got to look at the two. And that's when it hit me. Well, what we were dealing with in that 911 problem was the difference between within group or subgroup variation, and that's what the P chart measures, versus between or the real, I've always preferred the word among for more than two, among group or subgroup variation. See, things in the real world don't tend to have a constant P bar. Proportion errors, proportion of anything. Some days it rains and some days it doesn't. And if the existence of rain affects what you're measuring, and in the case of telephone, the telephone business, uh, especially outside plant operations, it certainly does. Weather is a big factor in where, th where things break down. So the very assumption behind using a P chart that is, there is, in fact, a constant, unchanging attribute P of capital P bar up there in the sky, and we're going to try to measure it with our sample P bar, and we're going to try to put an interval around that called a control interval. We violated the first assumption. We know it doesn't make sense to have a constant P bar. There's got to be some way to reach in there and pull out the between subgroup variation but not to the point of using the total variation, the mistake most engineers make when they first learn control charts. They, they want to use the root mean square sigma. And we, we know in our study of quality that Schuhart taught us that short run variation is the key. Well, anyway, here, here's how it started. Get into the presentation itself. Um, this particular presentation was uh, uh, originally written for the ASQ's third annual Six Sigma Forum Roundtable in New Orleans. Uh, fortunately, prior to Katrina, there was still a place to meet. Um, and I gave this one, uh, this version of it again, uh, a little later in Atlanta. P charts and U charts that the Poisson version. The, a P chart measures percent errors. The U chart measures the number of defects. There can be more defects per unit. Uh, a U value can be greater than one. Try to remember that. But if there are times when we see too many false alarms. We, we see, uh, we're going to talk during this presentation about when this happens, why it happens, what the traditional remedies have been, and perhaps a better way. If you, uh, if you take what I was saying while waving my arms a moment ago, now putting it on paper, this is what I was saying. This is the formula, the binomial assumptions formula for the standard deviation of, of uh, proportions. It's the average proportion times 1 minus the average proportion divided by, and if there's a purist in the crowd, I know it's really n minus 1. But for numbers this size, it doesn't matter. Anyway, square root of that. Uh, plus or minus three of those is where we are told to put the control limits in a p-chart. And if p-bar really is constant over time, there's not a thing wrong with this. But this is what it can sometimes look like. And I think these are the actual data I'm going to be using in, a, in an exercise a little later. But this happens a lot. Uh, I've seen it happen. It happens. Uh, uh, again, in the telephone company, but I've had a lot of colleagues in the healthcare industry report the same problem, where their sample sizes are number of patients, and the thing they're measuring is something that goes wrong for this patient. They were, they're not uh, treated properly. They received the wrong dose, or uh, they acquired a hospital-born infection, or something like, horrible like that. And I, <laughs> Um, but 
this this what this is a picture of what has become known as over dispersion. The data look like they just couldn't possibly have come from the underlying binomial model, and that's because they don't. The binomial assumption of a fixed constant parameter about which our samples vary is invalid. The parameter itself, the target is moving. There's common cause variation here in the parameter itself that can't be explained by that p times 1 minus p over n. As I say, the Western Electric properly entitled the AT&T handbook, I think, gave us a solution for that, and that's just forget that the data are p-values, just treat them as an, a single observation. At this time, I saw this number. And uh, do this formula to them. Uh, take the ranges of successive pairs, xi and xi minus 1. Take those ranges, absolute value, average them, and divide by the scale factor of 1.128. That's 3 divided by, what is it, 2.66, I think. Anyway, and that gives us an explanation, uh, a very common, commonly used type of control chart called individuals or XMR, X and MR, IMR, goes by a lot of names. And the data we just saw when subjected to the individual's chart looks like this. Now this looks like a reasonable control chart. Uh, one point here looks like it might might be getting a little bit squirrely, but all in all, this doesn't seem to be any cause for alarm. I don't see any shifts. I don't see any trends. So, so but it's total, certainly a totally different picture than we saw before. But again, rather than stop there, which is what people literally did from the 1920s until the 1990s, I just I, I worried about this wiggly control limits thing. Um, what if, just what if, in this fourth point, what if that was measured for a very large subgroup? A large subgroup would tend to have narrower control limits than most. And that point might then be seen to be out of control. So we really, there's a reason why you, you come to want wiggly control limits. They better represent the contribution of each point to the overall problem. So while, as I say, while thinking about this, I was listening to Wheeler drone on and on, and, uh, and what he was saying started to get to me. Well, this, I'm sorry, I should have shown this. For that point four, it was, in fact, a larger subgroup. Um, and so we, we need to take that into account. Well, one of the things uh, in the toolkit of control charts is something rarely used. Uh, it's called the Z chart. Um, and it, it's actually presented in many books as a way of eliminating the wiggly control limits. It's just if you don't want to see those, just do a simple Z transformation. Put everything in the in the Z plane, which is centered and um, uh, scaled. The, the, the minus P bar puts the data centered at zero, and scaling with the standard deviation gives you something that um, in a binomial data set would be a standard deviation of one. So Z, if, P sub, if the P variable has a mean of this, P bar, and a, a standard deviation of sigma, then the Z variable will have a mean of zero and a standard deviation of one, by definition. Well, that being the case, then, if you did this transformation to your data and then want to chart it, well, what's three times one? It's just three. So by convention, everybody just draws the control limits at plus three and minus three. The center line, of course, is zero. And there's a Z chart on the data we have here. Whoops. That didn't help. Well, of course it didn't help. 
because we're still making that stupid assumption that, the, that there's no variation here other than the binomial, which is not true. So here's the phrase I wanted to, a uh, uh, little nod to Don Wheeler here, uh, plagiarizing his book cover. He said, and will say to you if you ever ask, why assume the variation when you can measure it? He says that a lot. Uh, he's a big proponent of the use of individual charts in many, many cases. What that means is taking this formula again for the z-chart, instead of just blindly assuming that sigma is 1, why don't we measure and see what it is? Actually find out. And when we do that, we get this on our data set. And now it looks normal again. And we, see, we do see, remember that each of these points now has been, has been corrected for its own standard deviation based on its own sample size. So when we do that, we see that our, our friend point number four here is in fact still inside the control limits. I'm not one to quibble about on how close something is to a, li a limit like that, but just for illustration. Well, we've, we've arrived at something that was, uh, uh, a, it's really a breakthrough, uh, so much so to the point when, when I was in another class somewhat after that in Austin, Texas with uh, Tom's favorite competitor, uh, Forrest Breifogel. <laughs> I showed it to him, and he liked it so much he put it in his book, Implementing Six Sigma. He put this version of the solution in his book. He never carried it any further than this. But he said, you ought to do this when you see the problem of overdispersion. This takes care of it. And in fact, it does. But I was not satisfied to stay here because in the telephone company, like so many others, the people you work for are not engineers. Sound familiar? Um, many of them actually smile when they say, I was never very good at math. <laughs> well, they didn't know how to interpret this. Uh, what's a Z? How many Zs does it take to get a car started? I mean, or change a light bulb? They didn't understand the very basic interpretation of what these points are. So by means of a little bit of uh, algebra, uh, in the usual case we have this for a p-chart. Um, p is, this is turn, actually this is turning the z-transformation formula around. Remember z was p sub i minus p-bar over sigma. I've just solved that equation for p sub i here. And if you take the standard deviation of this line, this is a constant, doesn't enter into it. This is a constant, so it just flows right through. And so you're left with the standard deviation of z, the z scores. Now, that's the thing that the Western Electric Handbook told us was by definition equal to 1 but which we now have, have, have subjected to the Wheeler test, which says, don't assume the variation, measure it. So if you have your data converted to z-scores and you measure the variation by, by means of the Schuhart approach of short-term uh, average moving ranges of size 2, in the case we're looking at, I think this number was five in the, the data we were looking at, I'm pretty sure. And so the, putting that in place in the new formula, and I call this a P prime chart. I didn't know what else to call it. I wanted it to show the DNA of the P chart, but the mutation showing the prime. Um, so the new upper control limit will now be the previous components, p bar plus 3 sigma sub p sub i, times this sigma sub z. So you see the, here you can, you can come up with finally with an interpretation of what sigma z actually is. It is the relative amount of variation not counted for by the binomial. So if that number is 5, that means there's 5 times more variation in your data 
than the binomial assumption can find and explain. Putting it in a chart, there we go, final product. There's our data. And sure enough, you notice that at our favorite point four, the control limits are fairly narrow right there. So it was a good thing, good thing that we added the, the weekly control limits. It gives us more power to the test. Now, it turns out if you go back to this right here, that bottom formula, if you have a data set, real or, or, or contrived, that really is binomially distributed. You went to many tab and you said, give me a binomially distributed data set with this parameter. And you know, do that with several different sample sizes and whatever. Um, but if it really is binomially distributed, it becomes identical to the p-chart. Sigma z really is empirically very close to 1. Just differs by sampling error. And if you have a data set of any distribution, doesn't matter. But if you're in, if in your data set the ends, the sample sizes are all the same, then what you do here will be algebraically identical to the individual's chart. They're one and the same. So it works on, at the fringes. Uh, it collapses to the p-chart if you don't really need it, and it collapses to the individual's chart if you didn't really need to worry about the, the weekly limits. Now there's more on this subject you can find out there, stuff that uh, preceded my work. Uh, in this particular book of Wheeler's, he introduced something called chunky ratios uh, that he's pretty well still satisfied with, and, and good reason he should be. Uh, what he does is he takes the standard individual's chart formula, just like before, except he adds on this last term for no apparent reason. He just throws it in there. And what this is is the average sample size over the particular sample size for this particular point in this ratio and with a square root because we know the varia var variation is, is uh, inversely proportional to the square root of the sample size. So look at this, what this means. If you have, if you're talking about a point at which n is larger than average, this term is going to be smaller than 1. If it's a subgroup who is, that is larger than average, no, what did I say, smaller? If it's smaller than average, this group is, this, this term is going to be greater than 1. It's going to make the limits, I'll start over. <laughs> I'm getting myself confused. If n is lo relatively large, if n is relatively large, this term will diminish the control in interval. If n is relatively small, it will expand it. Doing that to this data using Wheeler's method gives us this. And I can click back like that. It just so happens that this one point does slightly go out of control using his method. It's not often that happens. I've done this many, 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 many times with lots of data sets and more, than off, more often than not these are very close. The reason they're not the same is because he's giving the same weight to every single subgroup regardless of size. So there's bias. There's, there's unquestionably some bias in there. But in the in the old days of doing everything by hand or in Excel or whatever, it certainly was easier computationally to just do this uh, than to uh, go through all that other stuff we had to go through. Uh, other research has been done. Um, one student I met at the University of Alabama some time ago, I gave her class my presentation on this method and she liked it so much she plowed into it for a doctoral dissertation. And naturally, being a PhD, she went to this Bayesian approach, and I don't do Bayes, so we're not on speaking terms, but uh, it was a, a <laughs> paper I, I still bring out every now and then and try to understand, but you know, just have a good laugh and put it back on the shelf. <laughs> um, the, uh, to, to summarize, the, the, we know from experience that p-charts and u-charts can be wrong, and uh, too many false alarms. We know why it happens. 
because the, the binomial or Poisson uh, distribution, which is the underlying assumption for the U chart, is, is not right. The, the parameter is just not constant. By the way, there is such a thing as under dispersion. There is such a thing as uh, having a sigma sub z that's less than 1. And what that means is that you have positive serial correlation or autocorrelation in the data. Uh, taking my case of outside measurements, if you've ever noticed weather patterns, rain, for those of us not in Arizona, those of us who know what rain is, um, if you look at a history over the last several weeks, months, years, you'll see that rain patterns occur in clumps. You'll have three days of rain, then four days of sun, and then two days of rain. So there's each subgroup is somewhat has a memory of the previous subgroup. It looks uh, the old stay, saying in the weather business, I understand, is the best predictor ever made is tomorrow's weather will be like today's. Um, so there is such a thing, just so you'll know. Uh, P prime charts, chunky ratios, maybe this Bayesian approach are obviously better ways. I, I threw this in. I, you, all, you do learn when you work with PhDs that you always have to throw this in. More research is needed because that gets you more funding later on. <laughs> but, but also it covers you if somebody then later comes up with something better than yours. <laughs> Say, well, I always said more research was needed, right? Okay. So let's see, moving on then to, I wanted to show you this in action. Here's a data set that I used in an article in um, Quality Digest magazine. I don't know when it was. I honestly don't remember when it was, uh, some years ago. Um, we have fairly large subgroups. This, this, this phenomenon of overdispersion can exist in any data set, but it's more clearly visible when there's large, large sample sizes. Because that's the situation under which the, the within subgroup variation just goes away and leaves exposed the between subgroup variation, and, and that's when you see it. So these are, these are pretty big. Um, you know, maybe not for E911 calls in Florida, but they're good size. And here are the number of defects. Now doing that in a classical P chart looks like this. See the problem. Doing it in a classical X chart, you get that better. But then when you do it to a full blown P prime chart, it looks like this. Now there's anyone who wants can uh, here's my email address there, david.laney at yahoo.com. Uh, send me an email and I'll send you this file if you want to have it. It'll, it, it'll show you uh, certainly better than I can now by just clicking on something and reading the formulas. You can see what I did. You can use this program with whatever modifications you wish to, uh, to come up with your own problems and some definitions here that might help you. I um, believe in this case yeah, this is the case where sigma z is equal to 5. So these limits are five times farther away from the center line than they were over here in the p-chart. But at the, at, at, until recently, this is where I would have had to stop. But now there's more. Effective next month, let's see, many tab, where is that? Why am I not seeing this? Tom, am I still in presenting mode? Uh, yeah, I still see you. OK, hold on. Download complete. Oh, you covered that up. That's what happened. Uh oh. Your little software covered up something I already had there. The software has a will of its own, as you know. I can see that. Okay, we'll 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 go after it this way.
This is a backdoor Minitab folks gave me to get into release 16.2 that's coming out next month <coughs> sometime. And um, I uh, I do have some questions pending too, David, but I'm going to, I'll wait till you're done. Okay, thanks. Um, hopefully this is masked. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's masked. <laughs> okay. <laughs> this is carrying me to a web version of Minitab 16.2. And there it is. There's that same data. Get this up here where you can see it. I know different people have different screen resolutions and things, so I don't, I don't, I can't predict what you're seeing. But there are 20 data points. And <coughs> I, so I'll speak for the rest of the people. I can see it just fine. And I would have a zoom in a window of 100%, and it's showing okay. your screen perfectly. Good. Thank you. Well, here's the same data we were looking at in the Excel case. Um, and, and, and if you're a Minitab user, you'll find this procedure fairly common. Stat, control charts, attributes charts, P chart. Now, this is going to look a little different than what you're used to. But we would normally pick a P chart. And I've already told it that column two is the variable and column one is the subgroup size. So there's the P chart in many tabs way of doing it. And you can see that there's a, there's a problem here. It's flagging more points than it's not flagging. Um, I think the only test I have on, turned on here is the point outside control limit. Tom taught me to not overanalyze these things. <laughs> uh, that, uh, so for, for many years, I've adopted the habit of only really looking at three tests. Uh, what are there, eight different Western Electric tests or something? Yeah, they keep adding more. I uh, know. And it's ridiculous. If you test it enough, it's going to fail. Exactly. Right? Uh, and, and Tom is, is the one who put me onto that, that if you did all eight Western Electric tests, you would have a false alarm rate that's just totally unacceptable. Uh, he can tell you what that is, but it's huge. Something like 20%. Anyway, I only use the point outside control limits, eight points that are on the same side of the mean, not nine many tab, eight. And I think six points in a row in a trend. But anyway, this is not acceptable. This just can't happen. So go back to 1956 or whatever it was and take the advice of Western Electric and say control charts, um, individuals, and by the way, another little hint, I never do this. I do this, individuals. Just show the X chart. Dr. Wheeler says the only legitimate reason for looking at the range chart is to prove that you did it right. <laughs> that you really did use moving ranges of size 2 in order to get the correct short run sigma. Uh, the actual information or, or knowledge imparted by the, the the range chart is exactly the same as that shown by the individual's chart. You really don't need it. So I, do, I don't clutter things up. Here the variable is P. P itself is a, just a number observed at a time. Oh, there it is. And that looks good. Unless of course you're dealing with one of those math haters that can't figure out what a Z is. So now, drum roll, we can go to control charts, attributes, Laney P prime, C2, column 2 is the variable, column 1 is the sample size, and there it is. Let's get these two up side by side. Okay. You may not be able to, I don't know how, what, how wide a screen you're using, I'll try to cheat them close together. Make sure everybody can see both charts. But there it is, the old and the new. And now, uh, let's see, I was going to close by leaving it on that screen, which is what I've been doing since I retired from Bell South. <laughs> there you go. <coughs> 
How'd, how'd somebody with your genes get to be so cute, David? <laughs> well, it comes from his mother's side. Ah, uh, I see. She she is from New Zealand, and those two gene pools haven't touched each other in 500 years. There you go. <laughs> yeah. That's, well, he's a cutie, that's for sure. So, that's um, Sam, Sam, my number three. So I am going to uh, take uh, take control back, and uh, thank okay. you very much, David. I've got, as I say, a couple of questions, and sure. if anyone else would like to ask, uh, now's a good time. Uh, I'm going to do something that's extremely uh, risky, and that is I'm going to show uh, my webcam. So uh -oh. <laughs> best wishes, everyone. So... Um, where uh, you're taking a look at me in my office, and I'm learning uh, how to use chroma key. So the next time I may be, you know, on an alien planet, but this is uh, this is the real world right now. So David, one of the questions that I have um, is from Matt, and Matt asks, "So what does Wheeler think of your work?" He approves it. He he says it's right, but in typical Wheeler fashion, he says, "What the heck, chunky ratios works." <laughs> uh, uh, certainly, you know, one of the reasons for using uh, the Wheeler approach uh, being that it's simpler computationally is going to go away yeah. when you get this into Minitab for everyone who has Minitab. You know, I don't think Don even uses Minitab. I, I could be wrong, but yeah. I never, he didn't at the time I was studying under him. Of course, it was a long time ago. But um, I'm, I hate to put words in his mouth, but I would be willing to bet that Don likes to have more hands-on control of what he's doing. Yeah, he probably, uh, I would think he uses Excel. I think he'll give that much of a I think concession. he uses a slide rule. A slide rule. <laughs> slide rule and pencil and paper. Uh, but certainly, you know, well, Don I got, is... I got uh, two degrees at Georgia Tech without a computer, okay? <laughs> did, he, uh, did he come up with chunky ratios after the P-prime chart? No, no, before. Okay, so... Um, I, I thought perhaps you inspired him to uh, to do it because it's hard to drive Don off of the uh, process behavior chart, which is what he calls well, the yeah, I, chart. I'm really not sure now that you mention it. Um, I did. I had not heard of the chunky ratios approach. He answered me as I was asking him about mine. He 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 sent me a, an answer that referred me to the chunky ratios. Uh, it, it's all blurred together in there in, in the late '90s that all this was happening. Sure, um, but. Uh, Definitely before many. Now there are other other software outfits. Uh, Sigma XL has had this chart for quite a while. Mm -hmm. uh, word gets out, and people have, have have corresponded with me saying, like the Sigma XL people, Noguera, I think is the guy's name, who's real big on this method. Yeah, Sigma XL is a, a nice package. Um, some of my yeah. students have that package, and uh, starting this year, we went exclusively to Minitab in terms of uh, what we provide for the students. But in past years, we provided both Sigma XL and Minitab. So, well, um, yes, in my extracurricular teaching, I would uh, we would always have to do it both ways, even when Minitab was very readily available. Uh, cl classes like at Southern Tech, where we were taking people literally off the street. They were not our corporate people, you know, they were just students. Sure. You always have to show how to do it in Excel because not everybody could afford Minitab. Yeah, that's still the case. It's a pricey package. Yeah. So another what question. You do, what you have to do is you have to you have to design a new tool and then they'll give you a copy for free. There, that's true. <laughs> that's true. Or uh, make it a requirement for your students. That gets you a freebie as well. So, <laughs> um, another question. This one's a little more technical. From uh, Mark. Mark says, following up on the idea of measuring rather than assuming, isn't your approach simply reverse engineering the CP CPK of each data set and plotting it? It's a very involved question. Hmm. Can you parse that, or should you answer, Mark, uh, mono mono? Right. That sounds about right, but uh, there again, in doing CPCPK, you still have, I would think, still have the dilemma of by what method do you arrive at a sigma? What is sigma? Right, and CPCPK and are capability C ratios, um, you know, which well, is yeah, a comparison you, of the requirement, which is not part of your method at all. 
No, 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 no. The requirement, yeah, that, that's cust that's the customer's responsibility. Uh, but e even in coming up with the curve that you use to say what CP is, CPK is, you still got to put in a sigma. Which sigma? Sigma sub p? No. I would use sigma sub p times sigma sub z because that's the total package. That's the within variance and the between. See, kind of, I forget. I forgot to say this earlier. What my method does, it actually takes a book by Fisher and a book by Shuhart and slams them together and creates an offspring. I'm um, Fisher being keen on the, the analysis of variance and F test and all that. the between variation. It's been ignored totally in control charts. It's true. Yeah, I hope, and I hope that uh, answers the question. Yeah, that's a good point. Um, I I pasted your email address into the chat window, so if anyone would like okay. to uh, correspond with you by email, uh, you sure. know, uh, it's there. You flashed it on the screen, so I felt like you were giving me permission. Well, by to, all means, I, I have it. I have time between grandchildren. There you go. <laughs> there you go. Um, and are there any other questions? So, as they say, uh, seeing none, I'm going to uh, conclude this webinar. I want to thank uh, David for uh, a great presentation on an extremely interesting uh, topic. And we look forward to seeing that in the next version of Minitab. And I want to thank everyone for attending uh, the webinar and uh, look forward to seeing you at future webinars. Um, this is being recorded. I'll post the recording link on my blog as well as on the uh, student forum in my training class. So you'll be able to come back and look at this presentation in the future. Uh, you should all have a link to David's slides, so you'll be able to look at those uh, in the future as well. And again, thanks everyone for attending, and we'll see you at the next webinar. Thanks, Tom.